Okay, and the lone professor, the math professor, some kind of damn professor, is back on the air. Oh, dear. It has been such an exciting week. I can't even believe it. But a couple more classes today, and I promise I'll stop. All right, so uh, today we're going to go over uh, some, uh, uh, finish off the stress um, uh, presentations that Dr. Schwerha had given me, and um, uh, and uh, go into chapter ten, uh, 10, Engineering, Anthropometry, and Workspace Design. All right, so we left on adapting to a hot environment. Um, so there are two ways we adapt to a hot environment. Uh, acclimation, uh, which is uh, doing things like sweating uh, in response to the temperature. Oy vey, I'm doing that now. I'm schwitzing like nobody's business. <clears throat> uh, and acclimatization, which refers to enduring long-term change in physiology uh, that enables uh, individuals to work in extremely hot environments. Um, so when we get repeated exposure to hot climates or hot environments, it starts to make it so that we can tolerate that, uh, that amount of heat. Uh, the acclimatization process can take one to ten days of exposure. Uh, although uh, my experience is for true long-term acclimatization, you're going to need much longer than that. Um, so when uh, that happens, the time is decreased that you need to be uh, 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 that you need to accustom yourself to that hot environment. All right, so measurement of heat stress. Um, one way to measure that is wet bulb globe temperature. Now you may be saying, what on earth is that? In um, we used to use an instrument called a swing psychrometer. And what that is, is that was two uh, thermometers and they had kind of an arrangement all right, so they're both attached to something here. And you would actually have a handle like this, 
you would grab the handle and one of the um, one of the thermometers would have a little sock on it and So, when you would swing uh, the, the uh, psychrometer, it would record the temperature in the air differently for each of the thermometers, right? The one without the sock would, uh, would uh, record the true temperature of the air, and the one with the wet sock would actually uh, then be uh, uh, be uh, the temperature would go lower on it because the evaporation of the water on the sock would lower the temperature that the thermometer saw. Then you would have a little sliding device. that you would slide down uh, and and you would slide it down so that it was uh, right in between the two temperatures and you would be able to read uh, what is the humidity, right? I'm putting down 80% as an example. Now, I assume that they have much more uh, sophisticated electronic in instruments to uh, measure that uh, these, uh, these days. Um, but... Air temperature obviously makes a difference. The mean radiant temperature, in other words, if we're working outside or we're working with a furnace or something that radiates a lot of heat, that makes a difference to you. The airspeed, uh, the more airspeed there is, the more cooling effect you're going to get from uh, the evaporation of your sweat and convection, and the absolute humidity. Well, of course, here in New Mexico, it is, the humidity is rarely high enough that it is even reported. Um, oh, okay, so these guys have a kind of a different kind of swing psychrometer. Um, um, uh, but I am guessing uh, this is uh, meant for uh, to be out in the sun where the swing psychrometer can be used anywhere. All right, what is the difference between heat exhaustion and heat stroke? Um, well, there's a, uh, kind of dramatically we're saying it's the difference between life and death. Um, heat exhaustion, you feel faint or dizzy, there's excessive sweating, you have cool, pale, clammy skin, nausea or vomiting, a rapid weak pulse, and rump muscle cramps. With heat stroke, you have a throbbing headache, uh, you have no sweating, your body temperature is above 103, red hot dry skin, again nausea or vomiting, rapid strong pulse, and you may lose consciousness. Either one of these can be a serious situation. 
heat stroke particularly uh, can um, uh, can kill you fairly rapidly. If somebody is having um, heat stroke, you need to call 911. If they just got heat exha exhaustion, put them in the shade, fill them up with liquids. All right, so the risk factors for heat illnesses of every kind, high temperature and humidity, direct sun exposure, and no breeze or wind. If you're also doing heavy physical labor, um, uh, you don't have any kind of acclimatization uh, for hot workplaces. You haven't taken in much water, stay hydrated. And if your clothing is not letting the water saturate it, which would help you cool down a little, by um, uh, by the process of evaporation. All right, so protecting workers, we need to know the signs and symptoms of heat illnesses. Monitor yourself. Use a buddy system. These are all good ideas. Anytime we can, we want to be out of the direct sun or any other direct heat source. Drink plenty of fluids. Drink often and before you're thirsty. Uh, drink water every 15 minutes. Don't drink beverages that have alcohol or caffeine. And the best is wear lightweight uh, light-colored, loose-fitting clothes. Well, I don't know if that's the best. Um, really, hydration is key, but also follow these other guidelines. So, how hot is too hot? Our heat ex exposure is a combination of many factors. Body heat results from the equilibrium of heat gain from internal work and outside addition, and heat loss primarily from evaporative cooling. Physical activity makes a difference. The air temperature, the humidity, the sunlight, and what kind of heat sources we have around. Uh, air movement uh, makes a difference, of course. Uh, you aren't going to cool as rapidly if you have no air movement across you. Uh, if we have clothing hampering your ability to lose heat, that is also a problem. And there may be individual risk factors. Uh, people that uh, have uh, had a heart attack, have uh, other uh, physical uh, conditions, or bad lifestyle conditions. Uh, you know, you've been sitting on the couch for 49 years. Now you decide you're going to go out and work on the yard. Uh, the sun's blazing. Next thing you know, you're keeling over. All right, so as management people, how do we reduce the risk of heat stress? Um, first of all, we have to commit to considering all the factors that contri contribute to the body temperature increase when determining if a heat hazard is present. For those of you who have studied work measurement, uh, you know that the personal fatigue and delay calculation uh, is very important. 
when we were working at the uh, Corpus Christi Army Depot, we had to persuade them to add heat stress to that personal uh, fatigue and delay uh, uh, calculation. So, if we can use an on-site wet globe bulb temperature meter, um, uh, so uh, that is uh, something very uh, useful to do. Um, you can also get the OSHA NIOSH heat safety tool uh, for planning the outdoor work activities based on how hot it feels through the day. You'll notice that uh, these days when they report the weather, they are also report the feels like temperature, right? Which if you look here at this little uh, app on this phone, it says, uh, okay, the temperature is 92, but it feels like 112. Yeah. All right, so OSHA you know, NIOSH you may not know. NIOSH is the National Institute of Occupational Safety Health. Um, a lot of uh, people who study uh, human factors uh, uh, work with them or on grants uh, from them. All right, so we have a visual indication of the current heat index and the risk levels uh, in our geographic location. We have precautionary recommendations to uh, uh, specific to the heat index associated risk levels. Uh, we have an interactive hourly uh, for forecast of the heat index values and the risk levels. We can change the location, temperature, and humidity controls uh, for calculation if there are various uh, variable conditions. And it also gives you signs, symptoms, and first aid information for heat-related illness. Okay, well, good to know. Our heat index is a measure of how hot it feels when we take into account relative humidity uh, along uh, with our actual air temperature. Uh, so, being out in the sun can increase the heat index by 15 degrees. Uh, Remember, though, the situation that you or your workers are in may differ depending on uh, what other aspects you have in your hot environment. All right, cold stress is also a problem. Um, we don't have many defenses against cold environments. Uh, so mostly we wear heavy clothing, we cover our face, we seek protection, or we use external sources of warmth. All right, so what, what does your body do if you have cold stress? If it's shivering, that is a way your body is trying to generate heat. Um, the development of goosebumps is another attempt on the part of your body to keep that layer uh, of air next to your skin uh, from moving. And vasoconstriction makes more of your blood 
uh, go to the core of your body and your organs. So, when we're having cold strain, we can get reduced dexterity. Your manual dexterity uh, begins to diminish. Frostbite, where ice crystals are developing in your cells and destroying them. Um, nervous block, your body's decreased ability to perform tasks develops into apathy, sleepiness, and then finally into hypothermia. So you've heard of people uh, being in a very cold condition and going to, uh, to sleep and then dying. That's what that nervous block is. At core temperatures less than 35 degrees centigrade, a person may not be able to perform simple activities. you have a loss of consciousness at about 32 degrees centigrade. Your heart may fail at 26 degrees centigrade. And when you get down to 20 degrees centigrade, they may not be able to find any vital signs, but you may, um, uh, but you may have enough oxygen in your brain that would allow you to be revived. So people have been revived after incredibly long periods uh, in icy water uh, up to, well, the longest case I know is 30 minutes. All right, so both whole, hot and cold environments uh, have risks and extremes that can lead to death. We need to know the signs of heat and cold stress and we can uh, and design our work environments and schedules to reduce that risk. Clothing is an important factor in reducing either heat or cold stress. Too much clothing in hot environments creates more of a risk while not enough proper clothing in cold environments causes a risk. So, the takeaway is anticipate, prepare, react to these risks. All right, and of course, this, uh, uh, this, pres uh, this uh, PDF file will be put on Moodle. Um, okay. Occupational stress, I am going to do that if we run out of material from our book. Um, all right, so chapter 10, Engineering Anthropometry and Workplace Design, Workspace Design, excuse me. Workplace Design is a whole different topic that we cover in Facility Design and Layout. All right. John works in a power plant. As part of his daily job duties, he monitors several dozen plant status displays. Some of the displays are located so high that he has to stand on a stool in order to read the displayed values correctly. Being six feet six inches tall himself, he wonders how short people might do the same job. Lucky me, at least I don't have to climb a ladder, he calms himself down every time he steps on the stool. Uh, stepping on a stool, that sounds pretty unsafe to me, but I digress. Susan is a floater at a manufacturing company. 
That means she goes from one workstation to another to fill in for the workers during their breaks. She is proud that she is skilled at doing different jobs and able to work at different types of work stations. But she is frustrated that most of the workstations are too high for her. One size fits all, exclamation mark, question mark. How come it doesn't fit me, a short person? She not only feels uncomfortable working at all these stations, but worries every day that she may hurt herself someday if she overextends her shoulder or bends forward too much when reaching for a tool. As well she should. All right. These are two stories where anthropometry, the study and measurement of human body dimensions, uh, uh, comes into play. So let's talk about human variability in statistics. Human variability comes in different forms. First of all, there's age um, variability. Your stature increases until you are anywhere from 20 to 25. Some of us st stop a bit sooner um, uh, on, uh, on that, but some uh, indeed do keep growing into that range. Uh, my oldest brother, when he graduated high school, he was 6'3". But by the time he was 20, he was 6'4". That then starts to decrease uh, anywhere from 35 to 40 years old. And women show more shrinkage than men. So you may see a little old man or a little old woman um, and think, oh, they've always been like this. But in fact, they may have been shrinking considerably in their old age. All right, well, we also have sex variability. Um, we know that on average, adult men are taller than adult women. Girls show uh, very noticeable growth until they're uh, 17, where boys tend to taper off uh, at 20. The average is that adult females' uh, uh, stature is 92% of adult males. Now again, that's an average, right? You may have a short man and a tall woman, uh, a super short woman and a tall man, etc. Under racial and ethnic group variability, Black males and white males average at the same height, according to the U.S. Air Force studies. Um, blacks have longer, uh, tend to have, I should say, because uh, none of this is set in stone, as it were. Blacks have longer arms and shorter torsos. If equipment is designed to fit 90% of U.S. males, it will also fit 90% of Germans, males, 80% of Frenchmen, 65% of Italians, 45% of Japanese, 25% of Thais, and 10% of Vietnamese. Now, one thing we should uh, keep in mind is that these statistics may be pretty old. 
the Japanese people have been gaining in stature a lot since World War II because they have better nutrition. And of course the Dutch uh, average the tallest people in the world. Our op occupational variability factors. Well, first of all, there is the type and the amount of physical activity in the job that they do, right? So we're going to expect a coal miner to have bigger muscles and be more robust than, and, uh, than somebody who sits behind a desk all day. Uh, some jobs require special physical requirements. Some jobs people uh, uh, tend to leave because of self-evaluation or self-selection. Uh, they say, I am not robust enough to continue doing this job. All right, so generational or secular variability. Um, we have had a growth in stature of approximately one centimeter per decade since the 1920s in average height. Um, uh, for example, uh, in World War II, when uh, all the young men were volunteering to uh, go fight the nasty uh, fascists, the average weight of a recruit was 143 pounds. Now these are people that, by definition, have to be at least 17 years old. The average height was, if I remember correctly, something like 5'6 uh, or 5'7. Uh, so, uh, now of course this was because of the effects of the depression. Um, there, uh, a lot of people didn't have enough to eat during the depression. Uh, and as a result, they didn't reach the full growth that they were capable of. All right. And these, uh, uh, the book makes the point that this growth has been because of improved nutrition and living conditions. Right? So in the 1920s was uh, the time when it changed from uh, you had a better chance of dying if you went to the hospital to you have a better chance of living if you go to the hospital. Part of that, of course, was that antibiotics uh, uh, started to come into, uh, uh, had been invented, started to come into production and were used. In fact, my father, when he was 13, was saved uh, by uh, sulfa drugs, which at that time were considered to be experimental. But since his father was a doctor, apparently he knew somebody. Transient diurnal variability. Uh, okay. Diurnal just means that um, uh, uh, that the day is divided into night and day. Your weight can vary up to a kilogram a day, so about 2.2 pounds. Your stature can be reduced by as much as 5 centimeters at the end of the day uh, because the discs in your spinal cord get compressed from all the activity 
that you're doing during the day. Um, strangely enough, uh, or maybe not so strangely, for astronauts, they actually had to design their spacesuits and clothing to be somewhat variable in size because in space you don't have the gravity uh, and the activities in gravity that lead to your uh, discs getting compressed. So when people come back from space, they're taller than they were when they left. Anthropometric data. Well, first of all, um, we have methods and devices for measuring uh, uh, measuring all kinds of things uh, on your body. Okay, so here, we're seeing some of these devices, uh, so sometimes it's kind of little calipers, um, uh, sometimes it's these little, uh, I'm not even sure what's called, parallelogram things. Um, uh, Right, um, I actually own a couple of uh, goniometers, which are devices for measuring the amount of flexation of joints. So I own a little tiny one for fingers and a larger one for larger joints. And let me put down. Two forty nine. Okay, so um, there are defined methods of measuring every part of your body, and you cannot even believe how deeply into this they go. For example, hand length distance is from the tip of the middle finger of the right hand to the base of the thumb. I would argue that it should be uh, of your dominant hand. So those who are left-handed should be measured on that side. But I'm not an anthropometry uh, expert. All right, so our terms in anthropometry are height is a straight line from point to point. Um, breadth is a straight uh, point to point horizontal measurement. Oh, bloody hell. Depth is a straight line point to point uh, horizontal measurement forward to aft, aft. In other words, from the front of your body to the rear uh, of your body. Distance is a straight line point to point measurement between different body uh, 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 measurements. So for example, a measurement of the forearm goes from the chromium to the tip of your middle finger. Uh, circumference is a closed measurement following a body contour. Curvature is a point-to-point -point measurement, point-to-point, 
measurement that follows a body contour, but it's not either circular or closed. Okay, so a lot of data has to be put together to, um, uh, to get a, a good sense of anthropometric uh, data. There's civilian data and there's military data. But here's the problem. Large-scale anthropometric studies are time-consuming, labor-intensive, and very expensive. So, a moat, or possibly most, anthropometric surveys are done with special populations. Pilots, military personnel, most civilian data doesn't exist exist or it's limited in scope. Um, for example, the weights of different parts of the human body, we are still relying on a study done by a Frenchman a long, long time ago. I think it may have been all the way at the end of the 19th century or maybe the early 20th century. And how he got those weights was they gave him 11 executed convicts and he chopped them up and weighed each part. Blah! Glad I wasn't doing it. All right, so... Um, so, as a result, a lot of our anthropometric data ends up being from military personnel. And there are some special populations we'd like to know more about, like children, like old people, but again, expensive, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. Um, all right, so currently what we do is we use um, uh, military data. And here is an example All right, so you see, as you can see, uh, they define very carefully what, uh, what measurements they're taking. And believe me, this is only a sample of the number of measurements you can get. Uh, sometime when you're here, come and take a look at my, uh, uh, my tables uh, for human data uh, in uh, anthropometry. Um, okay, so there's standing data, there's seated data. There's data on different parts of the body, the foot, the hand, the head, other measurements. All right, and this is an illustration of where these different kinds of measurements have to be uh, uh, have to be uh, taken. Uh, right, so uh, uh, as you can see, there's there's quite a few here, and depending on the depth, you get into even more measurements than are illustrated here. Um, 
No, I'm not going to tell you that story. It's too embarrassing. All right, well then we have to worry about functional uh, uh, struct blah, blah, blah. structural and functional data. Structural anthropometric uh, data is uh, the body dimensions in the Oh, excuse me, that should be standard, yes. All right, comes back to me now. In standard and still positions, functional, okay. Sometimes when I'm typing, my fingers just go wild. So here you'll notice I've got five extra letters that have nothing to do with uh, spelling functional. Functional anthropometric data is in various work postures. The problem is we don't really have very much of that. Uh, so that would be uh, uh, flexion and extension range of wrist motion, ulnar radial range of wrist motion, the reach envelope, uh, anthropometric uh, data is usually uh, static, uh, but our work activities need to be represented by dynamic data. So we have rules of thumb to adjust our static data to work data. We reduce heights by 3%. Elbow height, we consider to have no change or increased if the elbow is elevated. Our forward and lateral reach decreases by 30% if we want easy reach. <coughs> Some anthropometric data has been correlated, um, but the book doesn't really go deeply into it. You didn't realize I wanted you to capitalize the first letter? All right, so how do we use this anthropometric data in design, right? Because very often we will look at that for just a few variables when we're going to use it. Well, first of all, we have to determine our user population, right? That should be part of our human factors design Anyway, we need to determine what are the relevant body dimensions, right? If we're designing a new ergonomic chair, then a few things like uh, the, uh, uh, the knee height when uh, sitting or the underside of the thigh height um, the width of the hips and the shoulders might be important dimensions. We want to determine what percentage of the populations we're going to accommodate. The first way we might do this 
is we design for the extremes uh, where one or both ends of the scale might be accommodated for. So ordinarily we think of these, this data in terms of the normal curve, right? So sometimes we talk about we want to design for the fifth percentile. Sometimes we want to talk about designing for the 95th percentile. Design for, uh, oh, okay, so design for extremes. The best example that you might be able to see from where you are right now is a door. Standard door height is six feet eight, which will pretty much accommodate uh, uh, everyone up to the 95th percentile of males. Uh, in fact, even a little bit over that. Uh, uh, right? Now, designed for an adjustable range, an example there might be uh, the band on a wristwatch. Well, I don't know. Does anyone even wear wristwatches anymore? I, um, uh, they're becoming very rare. Um, uh, back in the day, it was a very proud thing to have your first watch. But now, I guess it's been replaced by having your first cell phone. So design for adjustability. Uh, for example, your car seat uh, is designed that way, right? You can adjust so that you're closer to the steering wheel or further away, depending on uh, your height. And then there's design for the average. Uh, an example of that would be the placement of switches for the lights in your room, right? They're at a short enough place that even the, uh, even pretty short people can reach them, but they're at a high enough place that tall people can reach them. All right, so we want to de determine the percentile value of our selected anthropometric dimensions. Um, all right, so in some cases we want to design for the fifth percentile in other cases for the 95th percentile, or we might be designing for some other um, uh, percentile. Right, we're going to uh, decide, do we need to use male or female data? Oh, you're killing me here. All right, now let's try that. Right, are we designing something that is uh, exclusively for the 95th uh, percentile males? Are we designing something that is for uh, women, but it needs to be for all women? All right, so we need that kind of clarity of the upper and lower limit for the physical dimensions of what we are designing. So when we say lower limit, that actually refers to the physical size of the system. A lot of times we want to be at the lower limit but we still want this product to be able to be used by 95th percentile users. Um, I uh, remember going 
car shopping with my uh, best friend from high school. And he was uh, six feet five. He had formerly been the center on our high school football team. Um, we went to the Honda dealership. And at that time, Hondas were pretty tiny cars. So he gets in the car, and even with the seat all the way back, he had to crook his head over to the side uh, to be able to fit. Otherwise, his, uh, his head was not just brushing the ceiling, it was like jammed into it in an uncomfortable way. Uh, my brother that I told you about had the same problem. He, uh, being 6'4", and he had a Volkswagen Bug. Well, a Bug is a pretty large, uh, a, a Super Beetle, I should say. Uh, the Be Super Beetle was pretty large, but it still, he was touching the ceiling in an uncomfortable way. What he did was he actually uh, took the driver's seat, took it all the way off the track, and set it into the, uh, onto the floor of the back seat, and then he was at the right height to drive and be able to work the pedals. When we say upper limit dimensions, the designer set a maximum value that is going to accommodate a certain percentage of the population. So we might say, you know what? We're going to design this, but no one who is over six feet tall is going to be able to use it. In fact, there's a, a certain uh, kind of stunt plane where the designer did exactly that. Uh, I don't think he did it by looking at anthropometric data. I think it was a mistake because the designer himself was something like 6'3". Only after he had built it did he discover he was too big to fit in his own airplane. If we want to accommodate 95% of the population, then fifth percentile um, female data uh, should be used. Um, uh, actually, that would uh, accommodate more than 95% of the population uh, because that would mean that maybe 1 or 2% of males would be unable to uh, use it and 5% of females. Um, using the 5th percentile female data as our starting point is very common in using anthropometric data to design. Uh, make necessary design modifications, I'm going to say according to the data from anthropometric tables. We need to remember a couple of rules of uh, thumb, that clothing can change your body size, right? If we're talking about something that's going to be used in the summer and the winter, then we might need to make an accommodation for bulky winter clothing. Uh, most uh, 
of our anthropometric data is from standing erect or sitting erect. Okay, so it may not be uh, a good fit with what we're trying to do. Oh, that ain't right. Oh dear, I'm just, I really wrote down the wrong thing right here. All right. Uh, all right, and our fourth, uh, uh, our fourth rule of using anthropometric data to design, use mock-ups or simulators to test the design. Uh, First of all, mock-ups can reveal interactions that will cause us to make corrections to our design. Our available users, we always need to remember, may not match the population we're trying to serve. All right, so some general principles for workplace design. We've got to remember the goals of human factors. Reduce errors, improve productivity, and improve uh, safety. Uh, other design factors that are going to come in are going to be cost, aesthetics, durability, and the actual architectural characteristics of what we're designing. Um, we have to keep in mind the clearance requirements uh, of our largest users. Uh, we often have clearance problems um, that we encounter, and they're very important. Not impotent, though. An inadequate clearance may for, uh, force an awkward posture. And of course, as I've discussed before, we don't want awkward postures. Um, so, if we do have that, that's going to reduce productivity and it's going to give us discomfort. Should female data be used for mixed workplaces? One of the things the book discusses, uh, amusingly in my view, is the possibility of all male or all female workplaces. More and more, we're not seeing those kind of mixed workplaces in the way that we did uh, back in the day when I was a, a, a child or a young man. All right, so our reach requirements should be determined by our smallest users. 
Um, so we determine that by the reach of our smallest users. I think I just said that, the fifth percentile. We need to remember there's a reduced reach when people are wearing heavy winter clothing. Our reach envelope is the 3D space in front of the person. And we say that the reach envelope is what we can reach without leaning forward or stretching. Objects that are needed frequently, we want to locate within easy reach uh, uh, area and close to the body. Large or heavy objects should be closer to the front of the person. And we're going to look at, oh, bloody hell. Boy, how long have I been on the wrong? Uh, well, damn it, I'm, I'm powering through. My powerful words should be what you are uh, uh, worried about listening to. All right, so here we see figure 10-5, and it illustrates... Uh, what are the different uh, uh, forward reach locations, uh, right? So we might define our dashed line here as easy reach, although we're likely to do it as this dotted line here. And then, of course, our uh, uh, solid line is full extension reach. Uh, how embarrassing. We need to keep in mind that some people will have special requirements and among those are our maintenance people. So they often need access to areas not needed to be accessed by the regular workforce. We want to analyze their special requirements so that we can be sure we're accommodating them. And there are rules of thumb about what should be done uh, as far as clearance uh, for uh, maintenance people But we'll go into that more on. Uh, we'll go into that more um, in facility design and layout. All right. So adjustability requirements. An idea of one size fits all. Actually, that's impossible. Um, the one that really uh, chaps my assets is one size fits all hats. Because I have a very big head, some might say swell headed, and, uh, uh, and so a one size fits all hat uh, very often turns out not to be a really good uh, choice for me. We want to make sure our adjustments are easy to use and we have some approaches to how we could uh, make sure that we have adjustability. The first of those approaches is adjusting the workplace. Can we do like a front surface cutout so that people with longer legs uh, can uh, uh, be accommodated? Uh, next is adjust the worker position relative to the workplace, can we adjust the height or the orientation relative to the worker? Uh, maybe uh, using platforms 
or step up stools, swing chairs, uh, anything that allows our worker to uh, be accommodated. Uh, uh, when uh, they need some adjustability. Maybe we can adjust the workplace. Uh, use uh, lift tables is one possibility. Uh, the authors also suggest using a forklift. Uh, however, I have seen forklifts used in ways that are very, very unsafe. If we're going to use a forklift, it should be uh, used with uh, what's called a man basket. Oh, come on. You only need one more letter. All right. There, uh, we have ways of holding work pieces in position so that they are comfortable. Jigs, clamps, fixtures. Uh, having part spins or, or other ways of holding things in the correct place uh, is also a great idea. And having adjustable tools uh, so that they accommodate people with different reaches, different heights, etc. All right, visibility and the normal line of sight our visual displays need to be easily seen and read. Our normal line of sight, oh, I'm going to be like that, are you? Is ordinarily. Um, 10 to 15 degrees below the horizontal plane. Visual displays that we need them to see need to be within plus or minus 15 degrees of the uh, area of, uh, of visual um, Acuity. Oh, let me out. High priority visual displays um, uh, need to get better space allocations. Um, so things like an exit sign, you may have noticed how exit signs are designed, right? They're usually lit. Uh, they're put up high so that things won't block them. Kind of important. And we go to figure 10.6 which kind of shows what our uh, normal line of sight and the range of eye motion uh, is. Okay, so uh, there you go. All right, so our component arrangement Our, de our designer's uh, task is to arrange things like displays, controls, equipment, 
tools, parts, devices. We need to keep in mind our principles and you'll notice that these match up with principles that we've talked about before of frequency of use, the importance principle, sequence of use, consistency principle, the control display compatibility principle of co-location, the clutter avoidance principle, okay, I can make that a lowercase p, and our functional grouping principle. One thing that is used sometimes in um, uh, in human factors is what's called link analysis. In link analysis, the relationship between two components constitutes a link. The link values are determined by the number of times uh, that they're used sequentially, so we call that a sequential link. An example, if A uh, dash B has a value of three, and one is used three times immediately before or after the other, then that would be a thicker line than other links that are used less. Link values uh, by the number of times used per unit time, we call that a functional length, a link. And the length of link is related to the distance of travel. All right, so oh, damn it. Forgot to switch again. All right, so here is uh, link analysis, right? So we assume these really thick lines are things where we go back and forth uh, between these a lot, or one is used a lot right after another. A thin line like these means, eh, not that big a relationship. Huh. All right, what is that? 10.8 on page 265. Huh. You know what, troopers? Uh, we have done about an hour and 20 minutes. I am going to say that we are going to call it a day right now. You notice I'm very tired and I'm making mistakes in switching back and forth and I don't have you all here to remind me when I make a mistake. So we will pick up from design of standing and seated work areas next time. In the, sta in the meantime, Please stay healthy, stay safe, and when the fields are white with daisies, we'll meet again.